So now what we're going to talk about is big data. Where does it come from and how will we use it for artificial intelligence? Big data is a big topic, right? Probably you see many references to big data in every context from autonomous driving to health insurance to computer games. And it is true, and that's good for artificial intelligence, that more and more data is around. As you can see on the right side, data is in fact doubling every two years. That is a tremendous exponential growth process of data. And we haven't noticed that very much because we have been fortunate enough that computers used to get faster even faster than data did. Computers used to double in uh, their ability about every 18 months. That's a thing called Moore's Law. Uh, the, the exact number of months is variable, but basically computers have kept pace with uh, the growth of data. Unfortunately, this is now ending because as you can see on the left side, all of those exponential growth are now leveling off. And that's because uh, computers computer architectures on chip is reaching limits of physics. If you only have a few dozen uh, atoms that form a transistor, if you want to try and make it even smaller, the quantum mechanical effects become so great that the whole thing becomes unstable. So the exponential growth of computers that we have been gotten used to in the last decades is over, and yet data is going to grow and grow and grow, and that actually has important implication on how we deal with big data in the healthcare context, as we will refer to in one of the coming slides. But first, let me say that we are fortunate for psychiatric applications that we actually have big data available. And this is an example you see here from a study that I ran that was funded by the European Union in which we were collecting data from structural MRI, so uh, SMRI is it here, functional MRI, which uh, measures the function of the brain using a similar MR setup. And what is called GWA here, the genome-wide arrays, those are genetic information. All of those data can be very big. They can be in the many, many uh, gigabytes to uh, terabytes of data. And we managed to get a data set together of over 12,000 individuals. And there's uh, data sets, for example, in the psychiatric GWAS consortium that have hundreds of thousands of individuals that are very, very uh, closely phenotyped as we say, or they're characterized using these data sources. So all of those data is coming in and we can use it to train our neural networks to do artificial intelligence things. And another exciting opportunity, both for artificial intelligence, but also for training uh, neural networks with data that are relevant for psychiatry and behavior is what's called ambulatory assessment. Pretty much every one of us has a smartphone in her pocket. Smartphones are very, very powerful computers. In fact, you know, it has been said, I think correctly, that to call a smartphone a phone is a little bit like uh, call a luxury car a cup holder. True, there's a cup holder in there, it has that function, but it is no longer the main function. And a modern smartphone has more than 40 sensors that we can use to, uh, to uh, find out how people are behaving with their consent, of course. And you see an example there in the middle, which we use in our own research, which is location tracking. We are interested in whether certain contexts, like whether you live in the city or in the country, or whether it's noisy around you, influence your well-being. And we use smartphones to just tell us where people are. And you can combine that with using a phone to ask people how they're feeling. That's called ambulatory assessment is shown uh, on the left. We uh, can contact a patient or uh, a research participant on the phone and ask them what uh, you're feeling like, if you're tired, are you content? And they can just pull uh, a few of these pointers there and give us feedback. And of course, as I already mentioned, we get data from neuroimaging, we get measure data from genetics, and we can combine all of these things, a multi-level approach that allows us to do justice to the complexity of the topic of psychiatric disorders and how they play out in the brain. Artificial intelligence and specifically neural networks are especially good for that kind of big multimodal, as we said, so multi-featured data set. And as you can see here in the workflow, uh, a lot of raw data that can come in from sensors on a phone, that can come in from a smartwatch, can come in from what people tell us, can come in from listening to people speak, uh, looking at text, all of those things can be used uh, to create 
uh, a big, as you can see here, table uh, of all of those things and then use a recurrent neural network in this case to extract relevant features from it. So one example would be that's currently uh, of uh, high interest. If you had a patient with depression, you could try uh, and extract features from how often she is moving, from what her activity level is like, what the sleep is like, to get a prediction of whether a new depressive episode is coming. And you can use that then to, to ask her to, uh, to come to the clinic or uh, some other intervention, which is shown on the, on the right side of this picture. So you train the recurrent neural network and the output can be used, for example, for risk forecasting or for interventions. And in fact, c smartphones are powerful enough that much of this can actually run on the phone, which is very advantageous because many of those data, of course, are private and uh, you can never use them without the consent of the participants. But you also want to be very careful that no one can hack into the system. Now, the advent of big data will transform through artificial intelligence, but also just through the sheer volume of information that we have uh, for every uh, single patient, transform the role of computing in translation. As you can see on the slide, uh, we have an ecosystem of clinical medicine that revolves around treatment diagnosis in the interest of health outcomes. And you have on the other side, an ecosystem of biomedical research where we are concerned with the mechanisms underlying diagnosis. We're concerned with finding new targets, developing new drugs, developing new psychotherapies. And both of these data streams need to come together at some point in order to manage the increasingly complex business of translation. Right? It used to be very simple uh, to uh, be a doctor. You just need to learn a few diagnoses and you had a few lab values. But we now estimate, actually, that for everyone who works in the clinic and for everyone who works in the bench, as a scientist in translation, we will need at least one other person who does nothing but manage the data that comes from these actors. And the idea on how to do this, you can see here, is an information commons. You need a secure marketplace, if you will, in which the information from both of these data streams can come together to create a knowledge network that you can then mine in order to uh, have the outcomes for the medicine of the future, better prevention, uh, better trials, better interventions, and uh, keeping in touch with our patients in touch with our subjects. That's going to be a giant task that will require a lot of investment uh, for clinics, for uh, industry, for people who work in research to keep up with this torrent of data and to leverage the opportunity that the torrent